First up, I'd like to thank the President of the World Dog Club and Committee for having me here. Um, it's a great privilege, and hopefully I'll keep you awake for the next half hour, 40 minutes. Um, first up, I'll give an introduction to where I come from, what it's like there, um, just, just as a background, and then we'll move on to the birds. Um, so the title of my talk tonight is Keeping and Breeding Finches and Native Softbills in Outback WA. Um, I come from a place called Kalgoorlie Bola, I suppose a few of you would have heard about it. Um, it's located 600 kilometres east of Perth. Um, we've got a population of about 30,000 people. Um, that makes it one of Australia's largest inland cities, or outland cities, sorry. Um, the town itself was founded on Paddy Hannon's gold discovery back in 1893. Um, and even to this day, the town survives pretty much on gold and nowadays nickel mining. Um, there are all the mines within a local area, and Kilgoolie is like the central hub that services all those mines. Um, the biggest of these mines is the Kilgoolie Superfit. Um, when that's completed, that'll be 7 kilometres long, 400 metres deep, and visible from the moon, they say. Yeah, the movie look back and forth. Yeah, but pretty big. Well, that's 23 years old, that photo. And it's, yeah, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, just got a couple of pictures of the gold. Like people say, oh, can you see gold? You don't see it. It's only like two parts per million or three parts per million. Um, so from there we go to just the gold bars, and that's what our town survives on. Um, Kalgoorlie has no natural fresh water, so all of their water is piped up from Perth, which is on this 600 kilometre pipeline. I think that, that celebrated its centenary um, probably about three years ago. Um, so it was an engineering masterpiece really back then. To, there's only seven pumping stations along the way. So that, that's where all our fresh water comes from. Um, that's where they store the water. Quite interestingly, I have a friend that works for the water corp and he sees those same swans sitting on sewage ponds later in the day. So, <laughs> well, quite possibly. Uh, we've got a couple of sort of notable things in Canada. We have our bush tulip school. <laughs> um, that is how it is today. They've reopened that um, in the last couple of years. Um, it's a real tourist attraction and it's, it's got quite a good feel to it when you go out there. We also have, probably Kilgore is more, more famous than gold, is Hay Street. Has anyone heard of Hay Street? <laughs> it's where all the gold's been. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we still have a couple of working brothels. I've been um, in there a couple of Too much information, Kim. Too much information. I'm taking one on the dead. And the two are last year. So I think there's, these were never legal, but they're always tolerated. Um, drugs are a no-no. There used to be another one and they've closed it down because they call them the drugs. So that's sort of the town <coughs> we live in. That's a bit of a background. It used to be a bit of the last frontier, but that's changed a bit, I guess, since the children came along. Um, now where I come from, the landscape and the climate, it's classified as semi semi-desert. Um, like I said, we don't have any fresh water. There is one that's man made, but we don't have any fresh water. We have a lot of salt lakes. Um, and that's, these are all blue bushes related to the salt bush. Um, you have a few gum trees. There's another picture. It's pretty sparsely vegetated, pretty ordinary. So it's nothing like our finches come from. We don't have a lot of seeding grass around. Um, our climate, um, our average summer temperature is 32 degrees, minimum in summer is about 18. Um, our humidity in our summer months is about 30%. In winter we get our average temperature is 18 degrees. 
you get the average minimum is six degrees and humidity is seven percent. Um, in summer you, get, you can get ten days in a row of over 40. In winter you can get four or five or six nights of zero in one. So that's quite harsh and extreme. Um, our rainfall is, we get 260 mils a year. Um, it's, it's quite a regular pattern. Um, this January just gone, we had 120 mils. So that's it's the hot, wettest January on record. So I'm looking forward to see how the birds go this, this year. Um, we get a lot of late spring summer thunderstorms. And you'll go out there the next day and the birds will be carrying stuff around. They really respond to rain. Rains on an average of 65 days a year. Sorry, I just didn't mention that. Um, Alright, my neighbours. We've got a total of 26 breeding aviaries, or call them aviaries, they're not all huge. Um, they vary from these little guys, which are about 3.6 long by 600 wide. Like two metres high, um, are just most suitable to put one pair of birds in there. They're good for crimson finches and things like that. Uh, they vary right through to my biggest baby, which is eight metres long by three metres wide, um, and that's suitable for my softbirds and my finches. That same aviary also doubles as a safety door to these four aviaries. Um, I was going to build a safety late my talk over and I'll just fill the whole yard in. So, yeah, that's pretty much them. Are they covered over or little? Which, they are clear, clear, and then frosted calcimite across them, and that hangs out probably about another foot over the edge, so they stay dry, those ones. Whereas this isn't, this is probably half open flight. What do you do on the 40 degree days? I'll get I'll get to that, but that's yeah. I'll, I'm getting there. Yeah, I'm getting there. Um, all right, because of that, the harsh temperatures and that, the aviaries I've learnt a lot the hard way. Um, I have we have a lot of problems with white ants. Not that they mound; they actually just eat the wood. So they're not any good for bird keepers. So a lot of the things in Kabul are built out of corrugated iron. All our fences. Fences of corrugated iron, as you can see in the background here, etc. So my aviaries are built of this corrugated iron, and on the inside of mine on the plywood, and between the two, I have an insulation back, just to try and get some of the heat off them. A few of the other aviaries, I've got double double roofing, so it's just corrugated iron. Um, you know, do you have steel fences here? Or? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we get these the fence battens that you just text through and I've just got one of them inverted and then I'll put another sheet of tin on it. But between those two I've got insulation bats again. That works really well, you can put your hand on the roof and don't burn it on the inside. And it, well, being hot, for, you get 40 for 6 days in a row, things don't cool down and it's still bloody hot. Like, but it walks all wine too, so. Yeah, so you, you sort of... Trying to combat that all the time. Um, that's just the latest bank of aviaries. I don't want to use the word last bank of aviaries, but I don't <laughs> think I'll be building them all for a while. I ended up making these from a 50 mil cool room panel. It's just fantastic to work with. I put up the shell of that in probably one lunch time from work. It took me about an hour. And that's six metres long and three metres deep. Quite expensive, but really good if you're going to put uh, the better quality birds that's what they went in i put orange cheeks and things like that in and they breed hard up on the roof mm -hmm. and things the eggs hatch even in the middle of summer um that's an internal view of that bank of ovaries um these are just melamine walls just for ease, easily wiping them down um, and something like that, I have one or two pairs of birds. Right. Um, I used to put these roof-mounted retic sprays on them. I don't like 
wetting the inside of the aviary. I just, I think that's when you get worms and fungi and candida, etc. So I try and keep them dry on the inside. So I had all these grey ticks on there. I used to run it when it was 40 degrees and then I used to get regular visits from our water pool because we were on water restrictions. Um, and while they couldn't stop me legally, I, I thought it's not worth the hassle. So I didn't have anything on there for a couple of years. Last summer, I installed these high pressure mist nozzles. A set, I think it was 20 nozzles, cost me about $180 from America. Uh, I can run that for the whole day. It drops the temperature by about 8 degrees, 10 degrees. You don't get pooling of water on the ground. Most of it evaporates before it hits the ground. And each one, I'm not going to quote exactly, but probably each nozzle probably uses two buckets of water a day, which that's not, I don't know how your water works here, but ours is, gets quite pricey. So they were really good, and that was even I could install it. So. Um, so I'm not a real green thumb, plus that's a concrete floor, so uh, most of the agents have very limited <coughs> or no natural vegetation. Um, that's a type of tea tree that just grows everywhere out bush. Um, I don't know whether I'm allowed to cut it, but I do. I guess the only part I'm not allowed is to get caught, so. <laughs> uh, in a big aviary, I have some vegetation growing, that's more I don't think having plants in an aviary makes the birds grow better, uh, breed better. I just think it looks better, but they don't breed better. It's just a thing, oh yeah, it's nice to look at. I don't have any grasses in there. I'm finding that the times I tried to grow any grass, the mice got in there and it, just, it was very difficult to control. Um, the floors, if they're not concrete, are natural earth. Our Earth or soil is red loam, very quick drying. It's very fertile if you can get the water into it, but yeah, that's just what I use from the earth. So, so you've got red eaves? Yes, yep. Oh. I reckon there's one of the greatest invent invent investments I've ever made, the cattle fence. The number of times I've gone out there and picked up a bird that looks perfect, but it's dead. Um, no explanation. We have, I live in suburbia. They have cats. That seems to keep the cats off and I don't get anywhere near as many unexplained deaths. In addition to the breeding aviaries, I have a bird room. Um, it's three of these flights. Um, I have cabinets, they're budget cabinets, and when I'm short, it's really handy, is I just get a cardboard box, get a cage front, and cable tie the cage front in. So they'll come to the end of breeding season, so sorry, end of winter, where I don't like selling birds through winter, but I tend to do alright through winter. That room's full, and it's just everything's overcrowded, so I just need more cabinets, and I just make these things up and just burn them when I don't need them. So, say, the, say the cardboard gets wet. I have paper, like I change the paper every day in the floor, but you just throw it away. Yeah, it doesn't, but last a fair while. A couple of showing off photos of this. Um, <laughs> there's some young lesser red grouse and white valley crimsons. Um, I no longer keep the blue caps, but it's just a photo that I had. And then another one, oh, but I used to try and keep the sexes separate, but it's now when you bring them back together on some of the species, they're just a bit keener. We also have these suspended cages. Um, they're about 75 long by 40 centimetres wide and 40 high. A few years back, I got right into the Red Eagle house I thought, I've got to be able to breed numbers to do anything with them. Like, they're not an easy bird to breed. So I went into Bengalese just to get the numbers up and then went back to trying to breed them naturally. 
I loaded nine of these originally. Um, yeah, and I, I wasn't going to throw them out once the bean leaves had gone, and I still use them for holding birds. Um, all the water, watering on them is automatic, which makes life much easier. Um, I feed it as just a commercial finch mix, um, nothing special. Over there, I think I mentioned the other night, I went to buy some red paddigan. This is two months ago. And they had three bags. I said, I'll take them. And I said, how much? And he said, $105. I thought, well, that's pretty fine, pretty good. It turned out he won $105 a bag for 20 kilos. Yeah, I totally, I didn't want that bag. So we, we have really strict quarantine laws. Like, if you see me birds, I've got to take the seed down and get it destroyed. They take photos of every bird you send me, and they've got to clear them. So it's not, you guys are lucky. You can go and get your greens and grains and frozen seed, we, we can't. <coughs> um, in addition to the, you know, the amount of normal seed which you're going to feed, I feed a daily mix of food. Um, that comprises of, I do frozen soak seed, just done with burp on this. Um, to that I add liver oil, the Mamaru soft food, any soft food, I think they're all much the same. And on alternate days I put in the slightly bite D and probat, which is probiotic. Um, <coughs> that was all good and did that for a while, but I also keep white gully crimsons and I've been having fertility problems with them. So I thought, I don't think it's the birds, I think it's the diet. So I've, I've just tried to cut <coughs> some of the protein into their diet. So I'll put in mashed peas and corn, which all the birds take. I've also added this kelp powder, which is 16%, 16.7% protein, and it'll stabilise wheat germ, which I don't know proportionally, but it says a rich source of protein. So they're just trying to vary the diet to see if that might, has an effect. And yeah, probably it has. I'm not. How do you know? I, I don't know. It's good. Um, the finches also get live food. They get mealworms, which I buy in from a place in Perth called Bugs and Things. Um, if I go down and pay cash for them for thirty-five dollars a kilo. She never lets you down, and that's more important to me than price. Um, I also feed maggots. I was told by someone the other night don't feed maggots that dirty. And I said, well, I don't anymore, that's just an old photo. So I clean the maggots, try and clean the maggots out to the best of my ability. Um, they also get seed in the grass. The yeah, backyard tends to be a paddock. Well, not really, but I just don't know it. Because the couch grass grows in the backyard. It's really, apart from barnyard grass, which I've been getting in late February, and it's going there for about two weeks until the council mows it, this is my own form of seeding grass. Um, and also the grass is, birds love it for nesting. Um, these are pretty standard sort of things. They get a good quality sort of root mix, eggshell, Cuttlefish and charcoal. Um, and the soft bills so I, I, that I keep, which I'll go through later, they have a different diet. They don't eat seed. They feed them seed and they did. So they get mealworms, they get the bushfire maggots, and in addition, they get brown crickets. Um, I feed them out. No bigger than a centimetre, or sometimes half, half a centimetre. Of the bush flies that I breed in house, so to speak, um, that's probably pretty standard, although you guys get one ounce, which you get spoiled there. Yeah? Just probably a year ago, we ended up building a cricket room, and we we'll breed crickets for more birds. It was middle of Soft bill season when I had heaps of young, I was probably 
been too much. Each week on, on crickets, I'd go through, if I had lots of nests, I'd go through 10,000 a week, which that's about $200 worth of crickets. So the way I looked at it, it was no good doing half a job. If they're going to die, you've got to go the whole way and then you get something and then covers your costs. So you're great. Uh, this room is made from, it's inside an 8x6 shed. That's 50 metal cool room panel. Um, I have a heater in there, an oil column heater, set at 28 degrees. And I have a dehumidifier. Big crickets hate humidity. And that, that, they just die, and then that covers your whole side. We've just got racks like these, so the top five tubs, there's six there, but only five of them, they're my breeding tubs. All these others are crickets in various stages of growth. And on the other wall, I've got the same. Um, that's a breeding tub. You have that ground up layer, layer mesh, uh, layer crumbles. I didn't carry it for moisture. And the, in the other ice cream container is, um, it's called vermiculite. That's soaked, wet, and then it has, in that Chinese ice container, it has fly screen over it. The female cricket will come in, She'll, she's got like a straw on the end. She pokes her straw down through the mesh and lays the eggs. If you didn't have that mesh in there, the other crickets would be in there eating the eggs. That there's a hatching. Um, that's probably from two breeding tubs. They're all crickets. They're all crickets. So you get thousands out of, out of a good hatch. Um, I don't store them like that. They, they will get the egg carton and the peach trays for accommodation. Small crickets are fed orange. And they'll clean that out back to the skin within a couple of days. The other thing I feed, and I did not quite know where to put it, is Lebanese cucumber. Um, finches love it, right? but also the soft bills. I'll reword this from the other night. I've witnessed a wild caught chat be released into an aviary and fly straight up and eat cucumber. How, how you know, I don't know. There's got to be something in it. Just a few things about. I love these soft pills, so I'm going to promote them a little bit. Um, a few things about soft pills. They don't actually have a crop, so they can't store food. <coughs> and it's also when you see a, a ring or something carrying a worm for the chick, that's because they can't store it. They've got it directly deposited in the, in the young one's bird. They have high metabolic rates, they're burning up energy because they're always on the hunt. They don't get fat, so if I put a bowl of mealworms there, they won't pick out and get a beast, they'll just eat what they want and the rest of the meal will stay. If you've got soft bills and you see one not looking good, it's generally they haven't got food or they've run out of food. Um, like when they've got young, you've got to give them a varied diet. Like meal worms don't usually cut it all the way through. You occasionally get one out, but they need a bit of variety. Moths. Um, the wife used the crickets, white ants are perfect. Um, they'll take maggots, but when they got young, they really want moths and crickets. They eat more when it's cold. It's very noticeable. Um, and the, la the last one I find interesting, you don't have to give them water. Um, they can go weeks without water because they get all their moisture from the live food. Um, when I send them away, I never put water in the, in the box. It's just, they get wet. They don't need it. Um, all the watering and all the acres in the shed is all done by automatic. I, I work full time with kids. It just saves me 15, 20 minutes every day. I have the time I probably think it's more beneficial to do it by hand, but um, easier for medicating, etc., etc. but it's just what I'm tied to. For nesting material, baby feathers, um, which I sent a bag at the front here today. I, I think they're one of the best nesting materials we can get. Can get expensive. Um, 
friend of mine in Perth, and I don't want to talk to someone later, he's got on the way Avatar in Queensland that sells them in by the kilo lots. I think we might pay forty dollars a kilo, which is bloody lot of feathers. It's just good revenue for the club, even if you just break them up in the bushes. I don't know. Use swamp grass. Um, that's like gold over there. I've seen a bag that big in a pet shop was thirty-five dollars. I found some that bush earlier, so I'm right for all that. Palm tree fiber that just is like a meshy sort of thing you get on some palm trees. We feed coconut fiber. They sell predominantly for the soft bears. I guess I've got siskins now, so they'll probably use that as well. Some of the species I'll keep. I might take credit for the good photos, they're probably <laughs> stolen from somewhere, but some of them are, are of my birds, but someone else has taken the pictures. That's the lesser red brown. I've had them for about five years. We've done extremely well with them. Beautiful little bird. They can be prone to fungal infection and worms. Um, but I just keep persevering. I certainly probably in five years I've been probably over 200 of them. They breed much easier than your normal red grouse. Um, that's me ready for tails. Um, again, beautiful bird, but very difficult. <coughs> Not only to breed, but to keep alive. It's, it's quite easy to get young out, but to keep them alive and, and repeat that for a number of generations is very difficult. Just what, what do they die of? Yeah, um, a lot of stress-related diseases. They'll get yeasts, worms, um, what's the other? They're just saying, not not the blue guardians. Like I call them the blue guardians of the Australian finches. Like right? they're, they're just you've never got them. If that might. You can never go out there confidently every morning and know that that bird's going to look great. So you just, yeah, they're just... You know, you know Tom Burke? Yep, yep. He, he, he bred them easily. But he only bred a couple of generations. He yeah. never... Yeah. yeah. You, said, people said yesterday, a good pair of birds can make a, good, a great bird keeper. Yeah. yeah. It's repeating that with generations and a number of pairs. Um, they're, but I think they're a lot better now than what they were. Mm -hmm. Just Probably we're learning good. more as well. You know, like back, I guess, in the mid '80s, they had a captive breeding program. These guys was, was not involved back then. The base, these guys were allowed to go out and catch them, right? And the aim of the exercise was to learn about them. None of them bred them. I went to one guy's place. And he had them in with a hundred zebra finches. <laughs> they didn't have to pay for them, so they lost them. It didn't cost them anything. So they probably went to the wrong people with the wrong mentality. If you are going to get something like this, you've got to be fair to them about perhaps just allocating an age to it. When parrot people do it with a $30 pair of red rocks. That's like the first one I ever bred. Um, and also to keep, I don't, I quit the last pair of these a couple of weeks ago, that's the black belly crimsons. Um, another great bird and can be very, very prolific if you get good pairs. I'm starting to concentrate on these guys. Um, started with two birds three years ago, we're about 25 now. Three steps forward, one step back process. But there's not many of them around and there's not much. Google. Sorry? Google. Not much. <laughs> I mean, the information is very vague. Like. They're all they do the black. Yeah, that's not very good. The biggest difference in the, in the cop words is the white and the black. The, the red is a little bit different. Yeah. Um, where the black belly tends to be more crimson, these are probably a little bit closer to the red. Yeah, I mean, like, people in the Ah. I used to, when I got them, I thought they're like black bellies. 
So I was very wary of what I put them in with because I've had some savage black bellies. Oh, of course, I didn't want to see it. But um, my foot run these with orange sheep vegetables now. Like they are really quiet. Yeah. Um, I sent a pair to Alf Watts out in Forbes. And Alf said to me, I've never seen a bird like it. It comes and lands in the hand. Yeah. Now, in 60 years, that's the first time that's ever happened. Mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. I sent one to Craig in Geelong. He sits there and prunes his mate. I've never seen it. Well, what's the most people in the line Just, we just don't know. There's, there's birds turning up with black halo, not black, grey halos around yeah. there. Oh, yeah. And we don't know if it's, it's crossed. Uh, they're crossed, but they see them in the wild. If you oh, look at no, a map in the wild, they're not even close. Yeah. So we just. Is it meant to happen, is it not? I don't know, and that's what I'm trying to learn myself. But that's that's one like one of the last frontiers for Australian agriculture with Australian fish. It's hard to keep that way. They're no different than normal. Oh, all right, yeah. and, and I've read, you know, cocks are soft. Yeah. Oh, they're no different. I don't find them The fertility good too? Sorry? Fertility? Good. Alright, um I've got that's why I've changed the diet. The first pair I got, bang straight away, I got four young out, which turned out to be two pairs. I've set them up, I swapped a couple. I'm very wary who I swapped yeah, with. Yeah. Um, just the hens are very difficult to tell the difference. Yeah, yeah, so we swapped. I sent one guy on one cop, he sent me two. And I know he's got good bloodlines. Mm -hmm. One of his cop leads had this new grey halo. I've never used it, but it's there. Mm. One day I might need to. Um, okay, so you asked me fertility. fertility. Okay. Now, fertility, I find I've got a lot of young pairs set up, and I get ones and twos and zeros and blah blah blah. You know, just not what they should be. They should be four and five. They're not old birds, and I don't believe they're inbred. Um, that, hence, that's why I've added the peas and corn and the kelp. Just trying up the protein and, and just try and get that to work. Um, I no longer get zeros. I'm getting ones and twos. So it, it's something happening there. And the other reason I think it's diet, right? I've got one pair that two Octobers ago brought out five. Then they went zero, zero, one, two. One, two, come October again, they brought out five. I've changed this diet, I haven't got the zeros in there. We're in October now, when I left home it was the 30th of September, they had five feet on eggs. So it's not, the birds aren't infertile, I'm just missing something somewhere, and I'm just not, not sure. So that's why they're a challenge also. Like, you don't want to just bring in birds that you're not sure of. Yeah. Also, I'll just leave through a few of these bit more common ones. Okay, the other ones. Um, I guess I'll follow the cycle a little bit. Yeah, exactly. That's a nice thing. I usually get a couple of these. I just, yeah. Over yeah. right there, um, we got a bit of a deal that it cost me $9 a bird, so it's oh. not. It's you might have to things. wait a little while, but. You can see the clock. What's that? You can see the cock in yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can pick it in some of them, like... No. no. Oh, right. Plus, I like to get... I mean, I don't have that much room to keep birds in them holding cages, and so I'm going to do you know, I don't know what I've got. If someone means up, I can move them on half-coloured, rather than wait and yeah. try and sit there and watch which is a cock and which is a hen. The black run bubble bars, and we bought six pairs off a guy in Fitzroy Crossing, all permanent. In 18 months, I've bred over 200. And I've got one, one of them can't fly, and never has been able to fly, and he's still breeding. That was five years ago. Um, one of my favourites, the white ears. Um, I had a lot of these birds and then when I got into the red eggs, so I needed room, so a lot of them went. So I've just got back into these. Um, 
I don't think they were as good as they were five and six years ago, just fraternity-wise and that. But others may prove me wrong. They know that. Also keep just, well, I thought they were just black-headed normal bullions, but there's been a few white breasts to turn up this year, so. Um, you do a lot of picturellas. Another one, but I think they like the drier environments, but again, if you get a good pair, they just pump them out. Okay, normal pungents. There's one of my favourite birds that I've got, that painted pop bird. Um, he's not a badly coloured bird if you like that. Some people don't like it, can't see why. But I guess they, to each his name. Um, well, so I don't mind my mutations, and I've been playing with breeding with establishing these guys, which is a form of painting. That's been another story in itself. Um, but I'm now trying to bring them full red frontage into these guys. Sort of slowly getting there. They're quite a striking bird. I mean, photos probably don't do it justice. These photos definitely. I'm in them all. My daughter likes red faced parrotfinches. Hence, we have quite a few of them. It keeps her interested. Well, that's great. She's 12 years old. <coughs> Is there any reason why you've got thick perches? Yeah, put these brackets and the thin ones fell through. Nothing, son. I pinched them. I've got orange tree blackbills. Again, I did really well with them probably four or six years ago. Pretty, almost 50. Thought they'd love to get them later. Got all the red eggs in. Got a couple of pairs of these, had them for probably two years, had them regular. But they did lay eggs this last autumn. They're a beautiful little bird. Uh, I mean, I, what I'm trying to show you here is I don't just keep expensive birds or rare birds, I like all birds. I kept a few runnies, or five, or five, or five. Kept a few tricolored nuns. Um, I'm a big believer in one pair per aviary of any bird. I had three pairs of these in an aviary. They are breeding well. A friend of mine wanted a couple of pair and I was going to get rid of them. I kept this my best breeding pair. I haven't bred another bird out of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, also got in uh, the pie diamonds. Um, just, just like them. In the, actually in the next stage we also got a pied star, which we've been playing with. But I don't think it's going to be a pretty mutation. It's just I'll probably move them on so. Also keep the yellow form of St. Helena's and sort of call them the poor man's orange shape. I mean, they're a lot of pretty birds well. Okay, there's one of my faves, the Japarini. So, I guess the last inch is got blue faced parafinches, I've got normals. I've just managed to get some Latinos, they've <coughs> disappeared off the earth in our neck of the woods. Um, and I've just picked up a couple of these guys and got a bit of yellow through them, so I'll just see how we go. I think I'm having six months, I've never even seen one take an interest in them. So, they could be 10 years old for all I know. Um, they're the finches I keep in the soft bills. I've got <coughs> these guys, which are orange chats. Um, I've really concentrated on them over the last couple of years. Um, in that time, from two or three pairs, I've bred 60, 60 young. It wouldn't be far on the side of 60 young. Again, they're very prolific. As you see in the wild, the chicks come out and the girls <coughs> must have a feast. Because they don't, they just sit on the green and hide. In an ivory, they get everything, they get protected, and they just breed round after round after round while the conditions are right. Okay, what front of chats? They're, they're a beautiful bird. That white is just snow white, and they always look neat. Apart from that hair. 
what's a pair of they worth? Oh, probably 250, 300 a pair. That's it. Yeah, they're you not. Know, this is my favourite bird. Okay, so they're nice. nice. Mark. Everyone that comes to my place loves them. I want to take them home. They're like wind up toys. They'll run around your feet. I've had guys with their big lenses come around, and there was in one particular case a guy from France, and he wanted to take photos and I wanted to go to work. I threw him the keys. He said, I'll be back after work. He said, I don't like them lenses. I can't get good photos of them. What do you mean? He said they kept coming up to the lens period. <laughs> <laughs> just a, this guy not killed his hand unfortunately, and uh, not many of them in captivity. But they uh, just a, oh, just fantastic. Character, they're all different. They all have their name. They if it rains, I can guarantee they're carrying grass the next day. That's how much they respond. They live in spinifex typically. Um, another red back wren, which I don't know whether they're this far down the coast. No, probably not. But that bird is black. That's how black they are. Jet black is beautiful colour. How much a pair are they worth? Oh, about three. Yeah, well, a lot of the cycles are around three hundred. Really? Sort of mark. But you got a problem with that? Yeah. Getting the hard, getting the contacts is the hard bit. Um, I keep them with a lot of finches. <coughs> some people have dramas with them, some don't. If you're not sure, work out what you want to keep. Prioritise what you want to keep. It's, um, keep the white with friends. It's really hard to get a good photo of them. They're starting looking good. Also keep red cat robins. Another great bird. Um, you see them in the bush, they follow you through the bush, yeah, looking yeah. for the leaf litter that you kicked up. You still keep the colour in it, or you? No, it's hard. That's, that's, they are harder the, than the chats to keep. Very particular about what they eat, yeah. like they'll only eat mealworms, they'll only eat crickets, whereas the chats you can get them to take nectar, and you can put colour feed in it. Yeah, they're a bit. They're not soft, but they're a bit finicky in, in what they eat. Like. Um, this photo was on here and I used it elsewhere. I just, probably in six, eight months ago, quit these guys. That's the inland ultra. Um, they're probably <coughs> that tall. Not a lot of them have been bred. Very interesting little bird, but one of the reasons I quit them, I found they move a lot at night, full moons. If you had the wrong birds in with them, you'd nearly always find a dead bird. I think they must fly at night as well. They fly a bit like a plumber. That's Dad. This pair in particular, this is the best mates. He'd sit, she'd, she'd sit on the eggs. As soon as them chicks hatched, he'd belt the crap out of the hen. She wasn't allowed near them. To think I can breed every single one of them well. You're kidding yourself if you think you do. So what I tend to do each each year or in certain periods, I pick a target target or target species. So one or a number of species. One, I've got to like. Um, do I think it'll be a challenge? Like. If I had staff inches, I'd get bored pretty quick. Have I bred them before? It's nice to try and breed something for the first time. How suited are they to the local climate? Like, probably, yeah. I've got chaff inches just recently. They apparently don't like the heat, so we'll see how they go. Do I have the age space? So, when I have a species, I say, okay, that's the bird that's going in that aviary, and I'll build the rest of the birds in there around that bird. For example, I don't put a parrot finch in with a soft bird because I'll just eat all the life of it. Can you get different bloodlines? It's a bit of a contradiction when I've been talking about the white bellies, but 
generally, I like to have a few pairs to play with. This last one um, is there sufficient demand? It sounds a bit money orientated, but I'm 600 kilometres from everyone. If I bred 100 stars, 100 mm -hmm. miners, do where do I go? Yeah. Um, so I've got a part of the choice in the species I want to breed, there's got to be some sort of demand for it. Um, for demand, we, we have, I get rid of my birds either through the finch pond, which has an option three times a year. Um, there's very few sold locally. There's good bird shops in WA, but getting paid for your birds is another matter, quite often and quite stressful. Um, so I send a lot of birds into state, um, but my bloodlines are probably very different than a lot of people's and they are not the same species. So that's sort of where my stock ends up going. So I plan on stocking the aviaries. Do I just go to a bird shop and buy a bird, we go put that in the aviary, we've all done it, grab another one, throw it in, and you know, before you know you've got 10 pairs of birds and an aviary suited to three. So with the target species, they're given every opportunity. In an ideal world, you put that pair in by themselves, I always think one pair in that aviary by themselves, you know what they're eating, they get no interference, and they breed better. Um, but most finch breeders, including myself, lack the discipline to stick to that. Um, and again, go back to that $30 pair of red rums, $1,000 pair of finches. How many of us think you can put five pairs of finches in with them? But the parrot man, we've got a bit to learn there from him. He'll leave that pair of red rums in the aviary by themselves. Um, so, I need to do a bit of planning when I pick my target species. Get rid of birds, language. Um, you've got to get rid of birds that don't fit into the plan. Um, when I'm stopping them, we're going to think about what are the birds like. Right? Is it an angry crimson finch? Um, is it a boisterous parrot, boisterous parrot finch where it got a black heart and go in someone else's nest, for example? Um, let's sort of just put a bit of thought into it. The size of the aviary. Um, probably in an aviary five metres by a metre, I might run three pairs of birds. Compatible birds, and that's compatible more with the target species. Um, you don't want them to hybridise. Some people do, but in my eyes, that's probably not going to um, Also, the inhabitants of adjacent aviaries, now that can work for you and against you. I always try and pair initially, when you force pairing birds together, put them in aviaries together or adjacent. And quite often, you'll get a good, really good pair form from one of these and one of these. That's your pair. So you try and house them so that the two hens might be sisters and the cocks might be brothers. So really it doesn't matter which way they go as long as they pair up. Um, and sometimes it's very difficult with limited gene pools on some of the birds. You've got to pair up for bloodline, not producing numbers. And that's where I'll probably house them separate. Uh, some pairs, like a, some, I always think all the birds I say do well in colonies are hard to sex. It's probably a fair statement. Um, but things like white eat must, I run them in adjacent aviaries because they do stimulate each other. But then you know the young from which pairs they come from, and hence you know what, what the bloodlines are. <coughs> I, in, in, I had in the narrow aviaries, this is a classic example, I had three pairs of crimsons adjacent to each other. They bred well. For some reason I decided to pull 
the middle pair are out. The next morning I went out there and both the hen bloods were dead in the corner. Jeez. They had no one to fight with. Um, a lot of people say, why do you keep native soft girls? Um, and they're not everyone's cup of tea, they do tie you down a little bit, but I find them interesting. <coughs> With a lot of your finches, you can pick up a book and it's all been done and it says you do this, you do this, and generally you get a result. Um, soft bills, on the other hand, is a new frontier. Um, I've picked up books, read something, and I know it's crap. I found completely the opposite. Them doctrals, I read the hen incubates, whereas my cockbird incubated 95% of the time. So you're learning all the time. That's part of the reason I like keeping birds. I get often people ask questions regarding soft bills. Um, the first one is that they have to keep. Yep. Very easy to keep. They've got the right food, the right inhabitants that don't just knock their food off. They're easy. You can put a bowl of mealworms in there, come, come back in three days. They won't just eat the mealworms for the sake of eating them, they only eat because they're hungry. Um, what I find of aviaries, a lot of books you read say, oh, they need to plant this aviaries, big aviaries. I've bred wrens in an aviary three metres by a metre successfully. Dry brush, no, nothing natural grown. Um, next one, if you ask, where can I buy the birds from? Or someone comments. <coughs> um, you just got to dig around it. it. Most people will put you in contact with someone. Once you've got your foot in the in the door, I guess that must be a secret squirrel thing, but once you know the right people, you do tend to get help. Because it's not in my interest that you keep them. Because I can't keep 10 pairs of them, because they all need their own aviaries. So it's nice to know that I can ring him up, and if I lose one, he might have one. Um, but I've said they're easy to keep. Are they difficult to breed? All them soft bills there are bred by the grass rings. So I'll say, as a general rule, no. Wrens are very easy to breed. Chats are quite easy to breed. Wrens more so, they're not big on compatibility. Chats are a little bit more picky on their partner. The robins are a little bit harder again, just their season is more contracted, so you can't really miss the boat. Uh, wildlife licensing requirements, that varies from state to state. I think they cat. Yeah, category two, is it? Yeah. yeah, I think most of soft pills here are on category two. Um, what species can I legally keep in New South Wales and nearly keep in any? Right. Um, there's not a hell of a lot you can't keep. In WA we're quite limited. Even though the birds are there in the wild, we're not allowed to import them birds.
a half to six hour drive. It's not like here if you're doing 200 k's and that's three hours. It is a good drive. So time-wise it's not as far away, but it's still a hike. So here we go. We don't get a lot of support that way, you know. I can't come here and talk to my mates, go on the my birds. That's probably why I talk about it. So how often do you get down to the WA meeting? I haven't been for about two years, but I know yeah. if I go, they want me to talk, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's just hard, but it's on a Tuesday night. So to go down there, you lose two days mm. of work days. Uh, back. <laughs> Any other? Yeah, what is your success rate with those red ears? The red ears? Um, <coughs> not for um, I keep, I look at it as a two-fold process. Keeping them alive was one of the challenges. I think I've lost one in two years. So I'm, I'm sort of at that point. Um, I just use Turbosol, that's the other one, Coxidiosis, which I didn't say earlier. Okay. Turbosol and Baycox. So keeping them alive is okay. Um, I'll probably probably would have read 60 young in four years then went on to other birds and now I've just got back into them. I went to a guy's place in Albany which is the heart of very company. I was always sceptical about how many he bred. And he said, oh, I'm coming down to visit. And he said, oh, my son let them all out, my grandson let them out. I, said, oh, yeah. and I went down there, I'm standing in the walkway of his aviaries, they're up there. And here's this ready to him. Frantically trying to get back into the This bloke's telling the truth. Like, you always, isn't it? Um, so he bred a lot of birds. He'd, he'd get down in numbers and he'd bred a stack. Others, or this, there's a few people starting to breed them in, the, in New South Wales, Queensland. Probably a bit harder in a higher humidity. Success. I bought, bought a pair off this John guy who's now he's terminally ill, so I've got to get out of birds. I went down there, he had a 3 by one avenue to five other pairs of birds. I had to catch the birds out for him. There were young red eggs in there. And he said to me, Oh, yeah, I've got to get out of birds. I said, Well, I'll buy a pair if I can have that pair. Well, had them seven weeks, they've got young in the nest. So again, the good pair make a good bird person. And with them, yeah, it's you can buy one pair, but if you think you're better off with getting two and maybe you get one to go. And it, people are breeding. They're a little bit like a diamond, but they don't flock like a diamond. They're quite a solitary. Yeah, they go in um, pairs or single pairs in I, I put them in as I've always put them in single pairs of red where people have run them as multiple pairs and succeeded. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to see the result two years down the track. Mm -hmm. Single pairs <coughs> Well, that's the ideal. No. You know exactly what's happening if you've got that one pair of birds in their cage. You know that they're going to get that grass, they're going to get that maggot, or they're not going to get that maggot. Yeah, if, if, if you know you're not nesting, we're going to fry some up there That's... I know this guy, I paid 550 for that pair. So they're around the $600 dollar mark for a pair of birds. That's pretty cheap. That's... It's a bit more reasonable, given how fragile that can be. But, but, what I was going to say is, I mean, if anyone's going to have success, I mean, it should be you, because you live near the native... I don't. My time, it's very different from this. I live in like the forests and... Yeah, but, but, but it's near. But it's near. Yeah. It's still 600k. Yeah. 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 So it's probably, a, yeah. Yeah. probably 800 yeah. kilometres yeah. away. Yeah. 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 But it's nearer than us. Yeah, but it's not the same climate. It's, not it's, it's, it's very different. different. Like, no, it's very we're very dry. Right. Right. It's like the communities. It is like the difference between here and the snowers. Sort of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're not 
Like they build a roost in there. Where they live, it's bloody freezing at night. Well, up in Pemberton, that's up in Mount, well, our mountains. It's bloody cold. You know, and they're there in numbers. It's, I think they, they need a lot of green food as well. And where I am, I can't grow a lot. It's just too dry. Yeah, but what, what, what Tom Burke reckons on his, on his show, he reckons that was his secret. That's all, <coughs> that's, that's all his secret was. Um, green seed. What? Seed and grass. Yes, that's, that's, that's all what they love. That's all it was. I've got a boss who lives in a place called Denmark, so he drives in and out of Perth. Yeah. We've gone down there and stayed. And he's got ready and his place. Yeah. I sat there watching him for about two hours and he'd just mow the kikuya. Yeah. And the birds are going while we're getting the clippings, the bottom end of the kikuya, and run it back and forth, back and forth. Mm. And that bird had disappeared, another one had come back. Mm. It was obvious it was a cock and a hen with young because of the way they were behaving. Mm. He'd do the same, fill up, go back. So again, all they're feeding that young bird was green food. And that's, if you can give it the supply, you've got a far better chance. I don't, you know, I, I feed cooch grass, but I might only get access to cooch grass for three months a year. Um, and that's really what they like, is that seeding here. If you can supply that, I think you're a fair way to succeed. They don't need a lot of live food. But I get fat, because they don't fly then. A bit like a diamond. There we go. Do you try feeding um, yeah, the crickets to the finches as well? Yes, yeah, the, the crimson is taken. Not all of them, some of them do. <coughs> Picturellas, they destroy them. Then so I don't put my picturellas in with my softballs anymore. Um, I've got a pair of painters, but as I'm tipping them in, they'll be sitting on the other. That, that, that particular cock, red crane cock bird, he, he does that. <coughs> I've got black rump double bars on the cake crickets. And that, actually, I've been, which I didn't show on I've been breeding melbas on crickets. Um, they take a lot of crickets, they probably take more than a soft build, but, but it's still done, and it's something I've never done before, for a number of generations. You don't fish too much, do you? No, we don't. I can't get mounds. Oh, okay. So I just can't. You know, I've gone out when I've run out of meal and they're coming the next day. Look at that pruning saw and got a big log and you, you might get 100 termites out of it, but it gets them through. But no, I don't, not at all. Are there nests within the log? Yeah, but you're talking some of the logs. Yeah. Because I looked around, around, around our place at one stage. Yeah. There's a lot, we a lot of woodcutters. Yeah. Like who are going and clearing, like for the where we went yeah. through today, yeah. with this new housing estates. And they're, so they're lopping down on the trees and they're seeing millions of termites all the time. And I actually went to one of the local blokes and said, Could you, I'm happy to pay you to have your bloke, because often it's in the stump where yes. the nest is. Yes. Right. Yeah. And they, they see them all the time. And I said, I'm happy to pay you. To get you, you know, your blokes to just get it out, just give me a call, I'll come and pick them up, you know, at whatever, or organise someone to pick them up. But the damn councils around here, what they say is, because I don't know why, even when they're clearing for new housing estates, there's some bylaw in the thing, they have to pump poison into the trees first, and then they come back a few weeks later and cut it down. So they're all dead. But maybe, you know, there's not many trees to cut down yeah. again, really, unfortunately, but, you know, and, and might be a source of you might find this tree stump in the middle of the bush. Yeah. So you've got to get a car there to, yeah. to be yeah. able to put it on. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. it's not simple. Yeah. It can be a simple process. Mm -hmm. There is yeah. termites halfway to Perth at Mount. There's hundreds of mounds. Yeah. Just a little dirt. I think they're sandy ones, so they're quite heavy, I believe. I've never tried digging them. But yeah, there's hundreds of them, but I haven't got time to go to this house. What's your word for rats, mice, snakes? We yeah. don't have rats in Kevlar. There's, I've asked old people there and they've never seen a rat. Snakes? Mm. Uh, we get mice, 
I've got a vacant block behind me where they mow it and get moss. But I, they tend to go to the chook pen, which is up in the other part of the yard. The snakes, I've only ever seen two snakes in Kilgore, and none of them have been on my block. One was in suburbia, dead on the road, and the other's on the, the tip road. Um, I guess they come in after the mice, so if you can stay on top of them. But I still, <coughs> you know, it's in the back of my mind, I'll tell you how to know. And we got jergites, and yeah, some pretty poisonous ones out there. Yep. Well, I can some rats. <laughs> <laughs> What about hawks and eagles? I've got a goshawk, yeah. and we get uh, a senegal dove, which is a bit like a spotted turtle dove, about that size. They get in the chook pen. Every now and then you'll hear this commotion, and it, it'll be the hawk you'll come in under the shade, so I'll drop in the, the pen, grab a dove, and nick off. Um, but he, I've never seen attack the birds. They're a bit wary if you're sitting in the tree, but I've never seen him on the aviaries. I had friends up there going, you've got to shoot that. I said, why? You know, hassles or anything? And he's, he had a pigeon or a dove up in the tree one morning, I had his beans, and I just watched the crow go over to him, steal his dove, and nick off with it. Well, I don't know if he's placid or he's in his head or, or what, but he doesn't bug me birds. So, yeah, we are in a build up area, but yeah, he's a lot of 500 metres away. I've seen a pair of wedge tail eagles sitting in a tree. So, once you get out of that boundary, it, it's the bush. Mm. You ever tried getting wax moves? No. Um, I'm going to let someone else figure it all out and then I'll steal the idea. <laughs> but and there has been a bit of talk with regards to how to do it. Um, yeah, I, again, <coughs> the crickets are still a work in progress to master that. You know, how many do you do at one time? Try, I'm sort of below trying to do something well and then move on to the next one. So, no, don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I'll say, so with your back issues, you must have troubles with your maggots cooking. Yes, so yeah, I've got cool. a phone call from home. Really? Um, yeah, they're, they're cooking. Um, I've got one in the shed, which is fine. Yeah. Um, the one outside, I went away to Perth two weeks ago and I only found out over the phone that the globe was gone, so she just grabbed, she who must be a day, just grabbed the globe and put it in and it was six so that was good here. But yeah, in summer you've got to remember to turn the fly box off. Probably thought you should put that one on the thermostat. Yeah, they're not going to Yeah, that, that would solve probably the vast majority of them. So, yeah, right. Another thing I found quite good and said the other night um, the soft bills and some of the finches will eat pupate. And we've just been lucky enough to get on the 500 kilograms of sterile root fly pupate, which is a lot. Um, they were doing a program to introduce sterile fruit flies into the fruit fly population. You can't program this guy's got stuck with half a ton of fruit fly pupate, so he's just giving it to us. They're all frozen, so they're all good. You're never going to hatch. But on um, the birds, I hope they did it. Virginal Toll Express at 4.30 in the afternoon. 
drop the birds off, they fly to Perth, they get it on the 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night plane to Sydney. So picking up in Sydney, they're there at 6 o'clock in the morning. They don't even know they've gone anywhere. Um, if I'm sending out the hunter, they go via Brisbane and, and drop in. Again, probably 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, they're there. So, do you usually so try to sell a big pump in it? Not, not really. With the soft bills you've done, mm -hmm. people only want a pair. You know what I mean? So, what's it cost to fry it to send a pair? Okay. Okay. So. Just got the, uh, the list of rates. It would be probably a kilo box, which, something like that, you know, 30 by 20 by 10. Found that the height dimensions are on the posture. So, the birds don't use that top bit of the box. So. Qantas cube it out, so they do it by volume, whereas toll it's just a straight weight. So a box would, I'd say, to Sydney, a kilo probably $70. Right, so the whole thing costs about $70 each. Yeah. And, and depending on, I'm not trying to sound like a but if you spend a bit, I tend to just be half of this, so 50 bucks, you know. But it's mm -hmm. where do you get any decks? Like on the um Till two weeks ago, I would have said I've had one in, I don't know how many words I've seen online, that was a white in mask. It went to Foster, where I picked it up. Um, I said some birds and fly around and sort of right or wrong. I said some white in masks away, again white in masks, to Melbourne. Uh, I know the guy, so I know what he done properly, there's no yeah. shit fight about it or whatever. Four of them just didn't look good, and they were the four that still had black tips on their beak. Um, he lost two of them. Um, but you know, I'm talking probably, I would have seen a thousand birds away, so three and a thousand, they're all replacing birds for me. Like, I, if I know you've done the right thing, I just I feel it's a bit unfair that you wear it and I don't. And it hasn't really cost. I can produce another one. Whereas yeah. to you, 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 but if you, you know, you pick them up and you're going to put them in an A where it's three degrees and they've been in the plane all night, mm -hmm. well, that's mm -hmm. a bit of common sense to me, so, well, you know. But I generally try and work it out. Mm -hmm. you know. To me, yeah, it's, it's, it's about the bird to me, a lot of it. It's not. It's, it's not about the dollar. If you're happy, the birds, well, the birds are happy, and that's that's important. Sure, the money's nice, but geez, you, you'll tell him, well, I don't want the birds of him, they're crap, and then you get, you know, it's. Well, you hear a lot of stories. Yeah. yeah. If you put healthy yeah. birds in at one end, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't get healthy birds out the other end. Yeah. I've <laughs> had a box drop, and that's another story. Um, and they got out, but they didn't die. <laughs> so we, we've freighted it and had freighted out and had the birds freighted in. Yeah. And I've never had a loss. Yeah. If you, it's I mean, a bit of common sense here, a bit of you know, I don't go out to the aviary and catch them out and put them in a carry box and send them. I'll put them in a cabin <coughs> and uh, it's just to make sure I'm happy. They look alright. And then you are generally pretty good. Um I had a I sent a pair of orange, I think I have another pair, but I sent a pair of orange check backs for this away, and the hen got a leg caught and tore the leg off. Um, she lived, so she's obviously the stress of the flight in the killer, but I ended up sending him another pair. I didn't have another pair in my own. Yeah, it's a bit, when you first do it, it's a bit daunting, but it's it works pretty well, but right? so, so it works very well, not pretty well. But so, so what I, what I, so what I don't understand is, so if I live in Wollongong here and I want to freight some birds, um, does someone come to my place? No, you have to pick up, it's only airport to oh, airport. So you take them to the airport? Yeah, mm -hmm. I take them to the airport, I pick them up in Karaburi, I hand them straight to the freight. They land here, and you've got to pick them up from the, say, the Toll Express, 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 Express,
So I don't believe in the rules. So is that still the way it goes? I mean, when you leave short goal, you still have to take the birds to the airport. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's the airport. That's the castle? No. Yeah. 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 What you do is you keep the map on this you are train them to fly up the city themselves to the top. You are train them to fly up the cells to the top. That's pigeons. Then they can get on the plane. That's pigeons. There's another example of our bird's trailer. I see a summer as we bring a hot bird to a guy in Fort Lincoln. So the birds go to the bird to Melbourne and Melbourne to have one in the local region. On those same flights, I see some birds from Darwin. This redback wren, somehow they mixed it up. They said it, so it went Kalgoorlie to Perth, Perth to Melbourne, Melbourne to Adelaide, Adelaide to Darwin, and Darwin Airport's closed on the weekend. They couldn't send it back to Adelaide. So I had to send that bird to Sydney. Then went from Sydney to Adelaide, and the guy got it two days later in Port Lincoln on his farm. After two days, yep. Yeah, so they're not, they're not crystal. Yeah. Oh, they're healthy. And they've got a bit of food in there. Put a bit of cucumber in, the wash through for the water. Oh, so, so you yeah. put a bit in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do get, they say you're not allowed to put water in, I just want wet cotton oil. Mm -hmm. I just think, like, we went to see Ray Aykroyd, who a lot of you probably heard of, the bit of a legend in his own lifetime. But he was talk we were talking about trapping, and I mean he had he showed us these boxes that he used to put them in. And I mean he'd have dozens of finches in there and he'd lose maybe five percent getting them from the Kimberley. And he's talking about walking out of the bush, you know, for a day with them. And these are wild birds, they're not used to see. And then putting them in the back of his four-wheel drive, you know, this is a long and time ago. Sydney, which could be a, a Along really dirt tracks and all that sort of stuff for weeks, getting them back to Sydney, getting them acclimatised in cabinets, all the rest of it, and then sending them out to shops and everything, and they reckon 5% is the number that they lose, so. Yeah, if you're going to do it, I recommend you don't They're tougher do it than we think. Yeah. Just the cold, that's an added stress. Pick, pick four or five things that you don't want. But if you're waiting three months for the bird, it doesn't matter if you've got to wait another month. Just be patient and, and you'll get a good result. You should get a good result. Alright guys, so let's thank you for coming out here. Thank you. Gary's got a young, young wife and a young family, obviously birds and all that sort of stuff. So he's, he's taking holidays to come over here, um, away from his kids and all the rest of it. Um, so can I just say?